Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health is a not-for-profit group of hospitals and medical clinics caring for surrounding communities. Their nurses, physicians, and staff are nationally recognized for their remarkable devotion to patient care. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. So here we stand between the echo of the South Carolina primary and standing on the cusp of all the activity around policy, around pomp, around political posturing heading into the Democratic National Convention this fall in Charlotte. It seems fair to say that politics will dominate most of this year in our region. Welcome again to the most widely watched source for Carolina business and public policy. I'm Chris William, and how will the DNC's conclave ripple out onto the rest of the Carolinas? And is there more than just flash of celebrity to it? Will meaningful policy emerge? Joining our discussion later on is Charlotte Chamber Chair, Attorney Frank Emery. Major funding also by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte, enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, healthcare, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded January 20th, 2012. On this week's program, Dr. Susan Roberts of Davidson College, Dr. Laura Olson of Clemson University, and special guest, Frank Emery, chair of the Charlotte Chamber of Commerce. Now, Chris William. Uh, welcome to our program. Sorry, it's taking a little off because we were talking about South Carolina politics. There's a, there's a shocker uh, coming out of the South Carolina primary. You two must just be in your element with, uh -huh. with South Carolina primary, with the DNC. You were going off on that, Laura. I'm uh -huh. going to give you a sense to do that. But uh -huh. is that the case, Susan? I mean, do you just feel like a kid in a candy store right now? Oh, I love it. I mean, if it weren't so fast changing. I mean, I woke up one morning. I said, OK, there's a recount in Iowa. What's going on? You have to really pay attention. It's changing so quickly. Well, well let me interrupt you for just a second. That recount in Iowa, what does that what does that mean for Romney? Does it mean anything for Romney? Well, I think uh, some of the newscasts went back and said we really didn't declare him a winner, but I think it does take the wind out of its, his sails because he was, that was the place in which he had lowered his expectations. And so he did better than he thought, which he could claim to go into New Hampshire and on into South Carolina. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. I, I had interrupted you again, but uh, L Laura, how do you feel about this point of time? It's got to be exciting. Well, it is thrilling and it's thrilling for the state. It's thrilling for the region and for our students and for everyone in South Carolina um, and in North Carolina as well sort of as a spillover effect um, and I agree very much with Susan that it's it's really sort of been an almost you have to watch a news ticker to keep up with every little yeah. detail that keeps changing um, and that really I think is one of the interesting sort of wrinkles or vicissitudes of the nominating process um, that really so much depends on who happens to be where and when um, and it's so much of it's situational. I mean, Santorum has his little bounce right before Iowa. Had that happened a few months earlier, we might be talking about a very different kind of landscape. Um, Gingrich and all the things that have gone on around his campaign leading into the election, um, had those things happened at a different time or not happened at all, we might be talking about a different mm. sort of um, arrangement. And it, it really is very, it's, 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 politics on the ground happening as we speak. So for those of you that have a front row seat, and by the way, for those of you that are watching, the, uh, our, our, this program is being actually taped before the end of the South Carolina primary. We want to make that full disclosure. But for those of you that have a front row seat, is there anything unique about this election cycle that, that you know, Susan, you might say, you know, that didn't happen. That worries me. That excites me. Is there something going on out there? Well, I think that um, one thing about the last nominating process in 2008 is that people became better consumers of politics. They could distinguish between what was a caucus, what was a primary, and it played its way out all the way through to the summer. 
I think what's going on now shows a little bit of the polarization within the Republican Party, when you look at the Tea Party movement right. and, and not the Tea Party, when you look at the people that are making all these uh, endorsements. And there's questions about whether these endorsements make any difference. But it's very complicated out there. I'm interested in Nikki Haley and a recommendation endorsement of Mitt Romney mm -hmm. in a state that wouldn't seem that fertile for Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. Do you mm -hmm. all get a sense, uh, Laura, let me ask you this, Occupy Mm -hmm. Take your pick. Occupy whatever. Fill mm -hmm. in the blank. And, and as you said, the Tea Party, they don't seem to have kind of the cachet that they did in 2010. At least the Tea Party doesn't. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong to think that? No, I have think they taken a second, uh, kind of a second stage here? Yeah, I think what happens anytime you've got sort of a nascent movement of any kind in American politics or in politics anywhere in the world, um, you have a few little victories and that can cause some complacency. Um, and so 2010, not that all the Tea Party candidates won in 2010, but the Tea Party sort of caucus or um, coalition within Congress made some significant noise after 2010. Um, and so you get a sense, I guess, that, you know, you've had a little bit of success. So do you then sort of lose a little momentum, step back from the process a little bit? Um, and I think there's been some of that. I think as well, um, the Tea Party individuals across our country, <clears throat> excuse me, and certainly within the state as well, um, they're not all on the same page about everything. Mm -hmm. And there are candidates within the process right now who have varying appeal to Tea Party folks. Um, and so they're, you know, it, they have not kind of come together mm -hmm. around one candidate. And I think, think, too, that where we have the expectations, they were very important in some of the primaries to nominate certain candidates, and they help set the agenda for the Republicans. And that's still there. Even if their power's not there, uh, Republicans are looking over their shoulders to see if Grover Norquist and some others mm -hmm. are sticking with this right. smaller government, which is echoed in the candidates that are running for um, the Republican nomination. Um, uh, Barack Obama's first major investment in this political campaign, in this election cycle, as he wants the re-election bid, is made in North Carolina. Uh, that seems meaningful to us, but maybe not meaningful nationally. Is that meaningful that he's made that kind of, you know, his first media buys are in the Tar Heel State. Well, I think I think he's looking to um, really recognize that this is, despite the Democratic National Convention being here, it is still a battleground state. I think he won North Carolina in 2008 by the s closest margin of any state that he won. And mm -hmm. so it's up for grabs. I think he's going to start early and getting his message out. This is one of the states that might signal. If you can look down when the election returns come in, you can say, OK, if um, uh, President Obama gets this state and this state, then I can go to bed at this hour. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's an investment in his future mm -hmm. as a battleground state. That's We are not a blue state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, and, and that's absolutely right. And I think that, well, clearly the Obama campaign knows, one, how valuable it was to win North Carolina so that the whole South doesn't look red on election mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. um, and one, one of the reasons why he was able to get North Carolina in the first place in 08 is because the primary here was so late and Hillary Clinton was still in the mix. And so there actually was a contest on the ground here mm -hmm. in 2008. And so Obama had folks fired up and ready to go, so to speak, um, in the Tar Heel State heading into the general election. And that was part of, of course, why he was able to win. Um, if you're going to replicate that, you haven't got any kind of primary contest to worry about if you're Obama this time around. And so what you've got to do is say, well, what is a different way of getting people rallied in that state, in this important battleground, in this kind of almost bellwether, I would argue, on election night. It's just like yeah. if you're an incumbent, Sue Myrick, um, <clears throat> and, and Charlotte, other incumbents for Congress, you have to keep campaigning, uh, even if it's going to be a landslide, because you want your name out there. And I think he's going to try to do that because they're going to be, you know, there's going to be bashing of, say, it's crossing the state line of President Obama and his agenda. So go ahead and be proactive. And let's face it, He's got the money to do that. That's right. Uh, it, it, also, sorry, sorry. it also shows um, that he's not being sort of a, a, a withering flower. Mm -hmm. That, no, I'm going out and I am contesting North Carolina. And anybody looking at the 2010 election might say, well, you know, maybe he can keep the states that he won in a convincing way in 2008. But I don't know about states like Indiana and North Carolina and Virginia. 
He's saying, no, I'm not conceding that. I'm going hard after uh, Okay, you, before you do that, because we got another minute or two before we bring our guest in. You know, North Carolina specifically, there's going to be a governor's race that's pretty key that's there. That's what I was going to say. Bev Perdue, Pat McCrory. I mean, they're looking, I think they're both looking forward to it. How will an Obama expenditure and how will an Obama win or maybe Obama not win North Carolina? Will they, how will they affect each other? Well, there are people that would say, and, and uh, former Mayor Pat McCrory would be the first to say, it was the top of the ticket that cost him the election. And maybe it'll be the top of the ticket, President Obama winning North Carolina, that will deliver um, uh, Bev Perdue back to the governor's mansion. I think it is a, is a big factor. And I think, in a way, he's, he's working. These Obama buys are helping the Democrats all the way down the ticket. Sure. Absolutely true. Same thing. Absolutely true. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You saw sort of a coattail effect for Kay Hagan yeah. in the Senate race in yeah. 2008. Um, the only thing I would argue, if Obama starts to look really strong here and it appears that he's mm -hmm. going to win the electoral um, votes from the state, um, then McCrory's going to have to find some way of making that gubernatorial race about something very, very different than party. we got about a minute left, and I want to get to this, too. Um, Charlotte won the DNC. We all know mm -hmm. it now and been talking about it, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. Uh, Susan, do you get the sense that Charlotte really understands what this is? And I don't mean from an economic development yeah. standpoint, but... Um, the DNC, the RNC, this is bare knuckle blood sport at its highest level. Charlotte is genteel. Let's all get along, but let's do economic development. Let's go, guys. Do they get that idea of what, what this is going to be? Well, I would say that it might not be as dramatic as we would expect because there's going to be, uh, you know, uh, a figurative hangover after the Republican convention. That's where the action is going to be. I don't know that it'll be protracted or this sort of thing, but we know who the nominee is. It'll be a little more relaxed. I think that um, this Occupy Charlotte movement, people are starting to say, oh, there'll be a protest here, when I have to point out that some people would say that the occupiers of any location were you know, people that were more identified with the Democratic Party, if they were, these citizens would not be occupying Charlotte. So it's, it's a broad spectrum, not necessarily Democrats uh, in that group that are going to protest when the Democratic National Convention is here. Are the right. occupiers, is that a wild card for well, the DNC? Yeah, maybe no. it's a wild card. I mean, it could be. You, know, you never know with groups that are angry, and, and this is a group which is, of course, rather angry about a number of things. But the fact of the matter really ends up being that President Obama is the sitting president. The security here is going to be absolutely everything will be just locked down. Um, and so I think that's going to be the major, the, in my mind, one of the most important impacts of the convention on Charlotte and on, on the region is just, you know, what roads are you going to be able to drive down? Right. And yeah, where are you going to, if you want to occupy Charlotte, where are you going to be allowed to be? And are folks going to get angry about where they are and are not sure, allowed to be? Sure, and there's a lot of, lot of enthusiasm. I believe, as I recall, President Obama, candidate Obama, was here the night before the election and uh, in Charlotte. And that was people, there was an outpouring of people that just wanted to see him. And I think that's still going to be the dynamic. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we'll leave it there. Put it on pause. We'll pick it up in just a second. Next week on our program, he is a, another politician, the Florence mayor. His name is Stephen Wakila, and he will be on this program. And then in two weeks, she is the new Davidson College president. Too much cheers when her name was announced that Davidson had a female president. Her name is Carol Quillen, and she will be here in two weeks. As an attorney, our guest is trained and comfortable with knowing details of any given issue and systematically working through them to, to some type of an acceptable outcome. Now, you contrast that kind of control with his new role as volunteer head of the Tar Heel State's largest chamber of commerce, uh, with which it comes with, with which it, with, with it <laughs> comes unknown variables and unquantifiable outcomes. Life can get pretty interesting for our guest, as well as the Charlotte Chamber. We welcome uh, Charlotte Chamber Chairman Frank Emery. Uh, Mr. Chairman, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Are you ready for this, uh, this ride? <laughs> uh, ready or not, <laughs> here we are. Yes, I think so. Uh, Frank, give us a sense of what you think. What is the long-lasting effect for Charlotte? You know, politics aside, uh, what do you think the afterglow for the region is going to be following the DNC? You know, I think there are three things um, that, we, that we expect to see. First increased name recognition for Charlotte and the region and the South. Uh, I think there are a lot of people who still have misperceptions and misconceptions about what the South is like and what Charlotte's like. So I want them to walk away not having to understand whether it's Charlotte, North Carolina or Charlotte, Virginia or whatever it is. Yeah. 
Uh, second, one of the things we've done at the chamber is we, we sent letters to the Fortune 1000 and said, here's information about Charlotte. Let us help you learn more about it. Here are packages about what we have in terms of schools and houses and relocation packages. So we're hoping after the, the DNC is here, there'll be lots of uh, companies out there who know more about Charlotte than they once did. And, and the thing I'm most excited about, the third thing, is that we've put together a directory of businesses, entrepreneurs, small businesses, who A, first of all, want to work with the DNC, but we want to keep that going after the, the, uh, the convention is gone to see those companies grow and get more opportunities to do business. So we'll, we, we, we have met new people that we didn't know in our own community as a result of this. Mm -hmm. Susan, question. Well, I just, um, there have been a lot of discussions about the um, uh, studies about what the economic impact would be. And I, I think you've answered one. I think, as you point out, there are intangibles. Are there other any intangibles besides the maybe short term? Here's what is going to happen with um, the package for what kind of impact it'll have on the economy. Well, you know, uh, the theme in the, at the chamber this year is outrageous aspirations. Okay. <laughs> and uh, my aim is that having the DNC here will help make people think larger yeah. about the things that are possible, possible in Charlotte. If we're successful with the DNC, uh, then, you know, I'm thinking there's no reason in the world that we can't host the summer games or the Olympics at some point in Charlotte. So, and there are other things, the World Cup soccer. So mm. really start thinking larger about Charlotte on the global stage. Are there downsides that you see potentially to having the DNC here? Um, you know, uh, any, any kind of challenges that concern you going forward? Um, I, I, it just seems like it's a wonderful opportunity for Charlotte, and it's a great opportunity to showcase all the diversity that exists here that people don't really acknowledge. But are there, are there any concerns that you have sure. going forward? Sure. Two buckets. I mean, first, you know, we'll, let's be clear. Uh, we'll be, the region will be holding its breath that whole week hoping that everything goes well and there isn't, you know, a repeat of Chicago in 1968 or, or something like that. Uh, so that's one. And then second, you know, let's, you know, there'll be a lot of people here. Um, you know, they'll, the, the security will be such that daily routines will be, um, will be disrupted. So, you know, they'll, we'll have to spend a fair amount of time reminding people that this is a short term and be good for us while we take the medicine of the week. Right. But uh, nonetheless, I think overall, uh, it, it's a very positive up net net. F Frank, mm -hmm. do you get the sense that the business community is as involved as the chamber had hoped they would be at this point in the cycle? Yes, um, we, uh, people, are, people are reasonably energized um, about it. I think uh, you know, they're, they're, the questions about security and access are still out there and folks are a little, a little uh, uh, concerned about that. But at least with the people with whom I'm in contact, uh, folks understand the opportunity and are very interested in that. Uh, the, the calls I get are, and the calls we get at the chamber are, how, how can I be involved? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how can I use this as an opportunity to showcase my business or and otherwise? Susan, go ahead. Please. I was just going to say, too, sometimes we look at the business side of it. The host committee have, has done a lot of things in terms of uh, trying to promote cooperation among the universities around the region in terms of are you having panels involving students in terms of internships. The staff at the host committee is even getting involved in, in civic duties, uh, volunteering with some uh, literacy mm -hmm. programs. And I think those are the kind of things. Mayor Fox wants this to be um, a, a convention that has a legacy, a business legacy, yes. and then a legacy about, as you would point out too, the can-do in Charlotte. Yes. And, and let me, this is going to be not usually something we do on this program, but before the program, Frank, we were talking about, has the DNC raised the appropriate amount of dollars that they had hoped to raise mm -hmm. to put this convention on? And Susan, you made the point that, well, you don't feel like they have to disclose that because it is a bit of a private party. Well, at, at least not now. I mean, it's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And they don't have, to the best of my knowledge, phone banks and everyone soliciting constantly they have, they've put on themselves the restraint of the People's Convention. Okay, so, so the question goes to you, Frank, have they raised enough money, and do you get the sense, and, and one of the question, or one of the issues was recently in the Charlotte Observer, they had gone, they had cut the days down from four to three, and they were going to have a family day on the fourth day. That does show that they are saving some money. Is that a concern? You know, I don't know. I, I, like you, I'm a little intrigued about what the number actually is. I don't know the number either and, and where that is. Uh, but what I have heard and what I'm comfortable with is they feel like they're on track. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, you would expect the Chamber of Commerce of Chair to say, we're going to get that done. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> it, and I wouldn't imagine that that would be incorrect. I mean, mm -hmm. I, this is the sitting president of the United States. Um, nobody's going to throw him a party that isn't going to be worthy of the sitting president of the United States. They'll find a way to make it happen mm -hmm. correctly. Yeah. Well, I just want to add, too, I don't think the people that work to invite the convention to Charlotte, I think they sat down and anticipated some of the problems they would have. And so I... I can't imagine that they would have not considered, can we raise the money, can we showcase Charlotte, because if they don't, there's a real downside. So I think they were prepared, at least intellectually, for, okay, what will happen if it's mm -hmm. over Labor Day and the question about labor unions in Charlotte? I think that was, I hope that that was mm -hmm. anticipated. Mm -hmm. I think that it was. I mm -hmm. believe in Charlotte as a, as a world-class city mm -hmm. we try to, to consider ourselves mm -hmm. to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Frank, let's talk about the incentives just for a second. Sure. Chiquita made a big splash. It was a great, great win for Charlotte and the region. Uh, it was an expensive, seemed like it was an expensive win. That's still going to work itself out. Some 21 plus million dollars to, to, to bring Chiquita. Was that worth it? Yes. Um, look, let's be clear. The region, in fact, in the country now, the way recruitment is done is through the use of incentives. Um, in North Carolina, I saw where we are rated as the second best enforcer of our incentive deals. What we do, you know, we, those, let's remember everybody doesn't get incentives. You have to have, uh, it has to, first, the only way you get them, let's start, is you have to bring net new jobs, net new withholding payments. Um, you have to actually put those jobs on the ground. They have to be jobs that are in contest, that is just coming. If nobody, if no one else is after your jobs, you don't get incentives. Uh, and then we monitor it afterwards. So yes, I think it was. And with Chiquita in particular, you know, it's a 10 year deal. The estimates are somewhere between three and $400 million in, in net payroll mm -hmm. up. Um, so if you think about it, a $20 million payment today for a possible return of three to $400 million it strikes me as a pretty good math deal. Is there any, any concern, maybe not in your head, but among economic development circles that, you know, it, it, and all the economic developers that we've ever had on this program will all say the same thing on the air and then off the air. And, and, they, and there seems to be a concern that the price tag for incentives continues to escalate. Is that, is that an issue? And at some point, do we hit a tipping point? Look, every one of these has to be looked at independently. But I think you make a good point. I do, I do think it is. You, know, you, you, you worry that there is an arms race, uh, in essence, right? And, and that we keep doing that. And, and, and I think you know, is there a breaking point out there? I'm sure that there is. Um, and I'd be the first one to raise my hand if I thought the deal wasn't a good one. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have to, we, we're, we're just going to have to trust ourselves and future leaders to look at these things very carefully. But your point's a good one. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it continues to, to uh, the, the price, as you say, the price tag continues to grow. Wait, we have about three minutes left. Questions? I was about to say something that might get me in a little trouble, but it's... it's oh, don't stop now. <laughs> um, it has a lot, it's similar in many ways to getting a candidate elected. There might be a point at which the amount of money that it takes to elect an individual might seem like an obscene amount of money, mm. but you have to get your name out. Well, you have to, to, to the point where we were talking before the yeah. program, Barack Obama's raised a billion dollars, yeah. when our theme right now is austerity. Don't those stand in contrast to each other? Well, I mean, I think um, it's long-term, short-term. The monies and the incentives are long-term investments. And I think if I'm a, a voter and I want to invest in my future, I might look to a President Obama or on the Republican side. I mean, um, you do, you'll know this, a war chest uh, can really intimidate future oh, yes. challenges. Which, which goes to the idea that the president's campaign has chosen North Carolina as one of the states to do his early buy-in, uh, media buy. Um, it shows that, hey, don't, I'm not backing down and mm -hmm. I intend to win in North Carolina. And it's, I mean, not necessarily scares everyone on the Republican side, but it sends a message, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, too, as Susan was saying, um, people who are upset or dissatisfied with their economic lot in life right now are going to see different paths to prosperity in the future, and one of the ways in which they might choose to invest, even in a small way, is by contributing to a political campaign. Uh, we have less than a minute to go. Uh, literally, Frank, any legislative issues that are most priority for the Charlotte Chamber this year? Uh, anything having to do with workforce development, i.e. education uh, and transportation mm -hmm. infrastructure. We're very interested in those two things. So you've seen some of the pushback in the region from Iredell County to the rail line. Is this something you feel like can get worked out? 
I sure hope so. It's critical to us. We, we've identified all of our asphalt solutions. So if we don't figure out other ways to move people around in our community, we're going to be stifled. So yeah. I, I really do think it's important, and I hope we can. Yeah. We're going to work toward it. Uh, that's the last word. Uh, Franks, thanks for being on the program. Nice to have you here. Thank you very much yeah. for having me here. You bet. Yeah, uh, nice to meet you, Laura. Please Thank come you. back. Susan, always nice to see you. Thank, Thank you. you. Until next week, I'm Chris Williams. I hope your weekend is good. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte, enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health is a not-for-profit group of hospitals and medical clinics caring for surrounding communities. Their nurses, physicians, and staff are nationally recognized for their remarkable devotion to patient care. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.